living the authentic life with Deborah Duncan and her son Duncan Horn and my baby. Oh yes, the Count Cremosta. Or the Count de Monet, she likes to call me. Yes, yeah, so today you can't really see, but I'm wearing like Julia Roberts inspired polka dot dress. Do you remember that dress? From Pretty Woman, Deborah. Yes, we love that dress. I know, and I told him, "Are you going to be my Richard Gear and like save me and come up with the, the car and drive up?" But no. But instead of that, we have a giveaway. More <laughs> stuff we love to give away. Yes. Today with you, we're going to be giving away this amazing Louis Vuitton Pouchette, which Bella says she's going to try to rig it so she can win. Yeah, yeah, because you gotta you gotta win it, right? We're not gonna give it away. Give it no. Give it away you have to, to follow it. us, follow you. But we are living the authentic life every day, and you are one of my most authentic, trusted friends. We call each other kind of inner circle people, and we uh. are there for each other. And thankfully, our two crazy men in our life, Duncan and Rob, kind of hit it off and have a little bit of a bromance going. So we thought that we should get together. Before the school year starts and talk about back to school. But before we do that, I'm going to launch into a little bit about you. And if anyone can see behind Deborah and Duncan's head, maybe you can move aside. We can't even show all of this woman's Emmys. She has won. Exactly. She's won seven Emmys. She's lived all over the world. She even lived in Japan. I know. This woman in Japan, you've got to be kidding me. You were a military brat that overcame the challenge of going from place to place and making new friends by completely becoming an outlier. And you can make a friend no matter where you are, no matter where I you am know, with you. What I'm going to tell you, because my parents used to lie to us. Like we'd say, I go, wait, what, we're moving? She goes, yes, we're moving, honey. And I'm like, well, would I ever see my friends again? Sure. Can we see them next week? Of course we can. <laughs> Why would we go from Japan to Taiwan to go visit your friends for the weekend? And then by the time you got settled, you forgot about those old friends. And you're like, hey, whatever happened to? Exactly. But thank God that doesn't happen to Duncan. Duncan... I know that you think I'm crazy. For some reason, just so everyone knows out there, we have this technology issue between Deborah and I that I constantly, I have her phone number in my phone, but I'm always texting Duncan, asking him if he wants to go get a drink with me. And he's responding and saying, um, I'm too young. I don't drink alcohol yet. But you've yeah, had this. Yeah, why don't you go with my mom? Yeah, why don't you go with my mom? But you've had this same friend group for how long, Duncan? Um, Probably about. Well, I kind of uh, started to meet them at different times, but Cooper, Cooper was yeah since I was two. Then Nick, probably about six. Um, then they had, Atlanta, a, they, they had a daycare. They had a daycare squad, so the, the group that met before they even went to school that terrorized the daycare. And I love that that you guys are still buddies. And how is COVID treating you? Like, did you always get together? Did you have to wait to get together? Like, how'd your mom figure out? who you could hang out with during COVID. Uh, but we're just we're really careful though. Like, um, you know, Nick and Landon are very careful. Most of my friends are, uh, you know, Diego's a germaphobe. So he's very careful. I know him. Yeah, he's very popular now, the germaphobe, the girls like that. Yeah. Now he like went from being at the bottom of the barrel to like, everyone's like that Diego, we he know. was a germaphobe before it was cool to walk around with Purell. Go Diego, go. He was ahead of his time. That call, that guy is an outlier for sure. I mean, cleanliness next to godliness. That's how yeah, I live actually, my life. He actually gets a lot of female attention, though. He, he does good. I don't know he does. really what it is, but <laughs> he does good. He, he does. does good. I, I You oh, know what? I'm going to use he's that a quote. Nice guy. Well, he's a really nice guy, which is what I like. Okay, so your mom has had this amazing journey. She went to UT, even though I'm an Aggie, I can say... Go horns, hook 'em horns. She lived in Austin. Then she went to Dallas when she was Good Morning Texas there, and then moves to New York and has this crazy illness in New York. Tell us about that journey and how Texas helped you out with that crazy moment. Yeah, it was crazy. I had moved to New York City, so the number one media market in the country, and I had like the, the best job, I thought, making the best amount of money, and life was perfect, and I woke up one morning to get ready to go to work, and then my head like literally exploded. It was the craziest amount of pain I've ever felt in my life, uh, and at the same time, I had numbness and tingling on one side, and I thought to myself, did I just have a brain aneurysm that blew? And I kept thinking, I should be dead right now, because as you know, many people in the first few minutes of that pass away. And so I, I ended up 
in the hospital emergency room and the doctor leaned over and said, your head is so full of blood right now. We really can't get a clear picture, but we've given you something that's gonna kind of, kind of buy you a little bit of time. Um, news got out back in Dallas, because I'd worked, as you mentioned, in Dallas and in Austin. They had it on the on the news channels. They actually killed me a couple of times, and then it was like the Lazarus effect. I, I, I came back. You're like, but, I'm back. Yeah, hello, I'm like a bad penny, can't get rid of me. <laughs> but the thing that was so cool is that, you, you and, I, and this is a weird way to say it, this is cool. I got to hear what people would say about me at a funeral without having to pass away. So. People sent in, you know, their well wishes. If they knew somebody in New York City, they got them to my to my hospital room. Uh, the Valones actually, you know, when you feel helpless about what you can do, right? The Valones called the Cirque and said, "Cater the Neuro Ward because if you at least feed them, right, the good, you know, this the Italian way. If you at least feed them a good meal, they'll take care of her probably even extra." So, yes, because uh, Donna it, loves the nurses and she knows the nurses are who basically run the healthcare system in our world today. And they're the ones that, yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. The doctors know what to do. The nurses uh, are kind of your friend as you're going through it, right? Yes. Um, but it was, uh, it, was, it was just crazy because I got just people who were strangers and like they would say to me, we may be a stranger to you, but you're not a stranger to us. And that is such, when you're on TV, when somebody invites you into their home, that is such a compliment. And I had all kinds of folks, you know, tell me stories of some some segment they had watched on the show that had helped them in their life. And so the night before surgery, the doctor came to me and said, can I give you something to help you sleep? Because I'm not, I'm not gonna lie to you. You got 30% chance, memory motor skill problem, 30% chance coma, 30% chance you don't make it. So 10% chance that you're free and clear. And uh, I said, no, if I die, I hope I know where I'm going. And if I live, it means I have more to do. So that's how I tried to live my life ever since then is getting to that more to do that a lot of us just can't seem to find enough time for. And the most big thing you had to do was have this incredible, good-looking, cool, fun kid next to you, which, look at that smile. Okay, so you are a junior at Memorial, Duncan? Yes, from going to When When we actually have school. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and you have thrived in school, struggled in school, love school, hate school, all the above school? Yes. All the above. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So did you want to go back? I mean, you and Rob have talked about, you guys are, yeah. I have ADD, horrible, but I'm really good because I figured out to do what I can do. I do it well. And then I have people around me that help finish and fix Wait, what are we talking about? <laughs> yeah. and, and it works, and it works well because no, I, I can do 10 things at once. I can get seven of them completed, 90%. Three kind of just fall off, and then we pick it up later, and it seems to work. And people, you said they, they said that to you. They didn't ever give me medicine because I, my parents didn't believe in it, and they just said I was a hyper kid, and they told them to give them less sugar, so I wasn't allowed to drink soda after probably age nine or do anything like that. And now I don't miss not having soda, but I just have this huge energy, thirst for knowledge. I want to know everything. I always ask why, 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 why. And I don't have a huge filter, and I sometimes get in trouble for that. So I'm giving you my free advice. Sometimes we have to think extra hard with our conditions before we say something that gets us in trouble. But you might not have that issue. I get, see this right here on my cheek? I don't know if you guys can see it. It's a permanent mark from my wife smacking me to just, <laughs> did you just say that? My parents are listening to this podcast. You can't say that. But what I love about, uh, about Duncan is that um, you say things that you mean. And you are a young man who has this great, value system. And when we went out to dinner the other night, we were talking about kids and vaping and drugs and distractions and all these things. You want to share a little bit about being a kid growing up with all that influence from social media and all that out there and how you kind of resist it all? Um, I'm not really sure where I really got that, but I'm you know very against it, very against all of it. But I think it was just the influence of my parents. But I don't know, I just kind of always had kind of just a very anti drug, anti jewel, anti smoking. You just didn't want to do anything and, to hurt yourself, right? But I remember some of my family, some of, oh, sorry about that. Some of my family members um, 
you know, we're nicotine addicts and all that. One of our family members was a drug addict for a while, but then got clean. You know, it's just a scary thing. I just always had that intuition, just never to try it. And also you were running track last year, and I don't know if a memorial tests, but lots of schools tests so that you can be a student athlete. Hopefully they let you come back and you guys can have sports again this year because that's a great way to get the pressure off of you too. Look, guys, I'm in sports. It's really important to me. I, I don't want to do this. Um, it, it, they'll take away my sports. So that's a really good way that you can get to not have to um, bow down to the pressure. Yeah, he was funny that the last track meet they had before everything shut down, he, he won his, his meet in the district. And it was like, wait, you're kidding me. Now it's over? Yeah. How do you do track online? How are you supposed to do track online? Oh, we just get a treadmill. We just turn it to 101. <laughs> well, I would think that they could do that because as fast as he runs, he's going to be at least six feet away from everybody. <laughs> so that's fine. I mean, I, I get it. You know, or do a staggered start all six foot apart and put the really <laughs> fast guys further ahead. And then the guys that are slow just really look like they were slow. Just to say, they're, they're trying to be safe. Yes, exactly. And I think there's such a fine line. We grew up sharing everything with Bella, kind of to the point that some people would say, I can't believe you're talking to your child about drugs and she's five years old. Or I can't believe you're telling your four-year-old, don't ever let someone take a picture of you naked. But there are so many things. And you and Deborah, uh, Deborah, you and I have had all these conversations as moms. And you are so exposed like to everything happening to a kid every illness happening to someone you have all these specialists how do you manage all that information and how do you decide what you're going to tell duncan for, versus what you keep to yourself yeah you know um he, he's pretty he's pretty intuitive and sometimes you wait for your children to bring it up right but you're right in, in the news business and in the talk show business I, I would come across a case where you go are you kidding me i mean kids is too, as young as two years old oh. and so you, you, you deliver the message where it's age appropriate you know you don't want to scare your child into thinking you can't even walk out into the world but you want to make sure that they're, that they're aware that there are bad people out there and at the end of the day the majority of people are not bad you know the reason why it makes the news in general is because it's the unusual thing that's happening but you know as we say one child harmed all children harmed right so you just want to make sure your kids are aware age appropriate of course but I, I have to say that there are things that you think, just when you think I've heard the worst, there are things that come up that are even worse. There are some really tormented people out there. And so you just have to be aware of, of, of what human beings are. And at the same time, keep the balance because there are a lot of great human beings as well, which is why I like to expose them to like you know, charitable events and things like that, where you can see that just at the same time you hear about how people can be awful, the majority of people can be kind. And sometimes it's disaster that really creates community. We saw what happened with all the stuff with COVID. We know what happened with Harvey. You know, strangers came out to help other people. And I think one of the best things that you can do when you help is for that person on the receiving end to realize that you are supported. Even though you don't know that person, that person is a stranger. They did something on, on your behalf. That's when you know you have community. I thought it was amazing when the Cajun Navy came in town and mm -hmm. just a bunch of good old coon asses with their, with their John boats and they were helping people. I know a bunch of people over by where Alma, my assistant for 26 years, she lives over off of Derry Ashford. And it was three, four, five, eight foot deep in certain spots over there. And they were taking the people back to their houses to get their dogs, to get their cats, to get their valuables that they had hidden and whatever. And they, they didn't want money. They didn't want anything. They were just such giving kind people. And it's nice to see Harvey, I thought, brought up a really a lot of the good or the great in our city. Yeah, and, and it's such a reflection of our city. I mean, you know, we talk about all the time that we're the most diverse city. Why is our city different than others in the sense that we've not really had, you know, knock on wood, um, the turmoil. Uh, we've gotten our message across. There was a, a, a rally, not, not a protest, but a rally to show unity. But we haven't really had the upheaval that so many other cities have had. And I think that's for a lot of reasons. You look at the foundation of your city. In Houston, you know, you, you come here to work. And if you look at the how the city kind of got started, you had a bunch of people in the, in the East Texas oil fields praying that it would work, just working together, brutal work, hard work, but praying that it would happen. And when it did, you know, struck oil, then they created the people who suddenly became these like, you know, billionaire billionaires overnight almost. Um, they said, we need health care for our workers. So they created the world's largest medical center, which is a nonprofit down there in that district. And so um, if you look at how we develop things, it's when you come someplace to work, I cannot be bothered by what your religion is, your race is, your whole bit. When you're down there in the operating room and you got to get somebody 
through an operation, I just let's work together. You know, NASA, failure is not an option. And so I think that's one of the things that makes a difference in this city. And it's, it's nice to be able to see on the back end of every disaster we've gone through, all the goodness that comes from it. And I can definitely say, as far as diversity, when we have a table full of friends, we see that diversity. You've seen that in your friends that you have. Duncan, isn't Diego from another country? Well, Mexico. Yeah. And the Nick is? Well, Nick's from here, but his mom's Greek and his dad's Cuban. And so there's a lot oh, of... Yeah. And so is there... Um, do you feel as a kid, because I look at Bella and her friends, do you feel that racial stress between you, or do you feel like you as a group of people at Memorial High School, that it's it's changing and that it doesn't feel as intense? Honestly, I don't, yeah, there's just not really, there's not really any racism in our school. At least I haven't experienced in it. Uh, nobody I've met has really talked about experiencing it. So I think this generation, it's pretty clean. I think but, a lot of it's gone. But there were moments think, with uh, you growing up that you had some challenges that your mom would help in communicating with the school, I think. Deborah, do you want I to did, share some of those yeah, journeys? A couple of <laughs> a couple of kids who uh, took liberties with the N-word. Honestly, I think they would just use it as an insult. I don't really think they were really racist. I think they're just like, if they were mad at you, they just know that that would be a word that they could use to kind of hurt you. I think it's usually where that why that would be used. That's so fascinating that you can see it from that perspective, because it is so much about them being an educated as and as opposed to necessarily or just trying to hurt you as opposed to really feeling that. Deborah, you and I had conversations about this, and I was just surprised to hear about some of your journeys because it wasn't oh, yeah. something I mean, that I, a, I knew of really. Yeah. Yeah, in Austin, I had a police officer who, who I was outside trying to figure out what to plant in the garden and a police officer drove up, pulled his gun. I was like, hey, wait a minute, <laughs> right? And and it was just kind of crazy because I kept thinking, did I rob a bank accidentally? And I don't remember <laughs> what, what happened. Like, what? Where's the money? I, I, I kept thinking, because I had to justify why that was happening, right? And I'm thinking, is there something I'm not remembering here? What did I do? Um, so uh, uh, did I walk out with a package of pork chops at the grocery store I didn't pay didn't for? Didn't pay for? Yeah. yeah. It, had it been COVID, you know, it was the toilet paper you stuck into yeah, your Yeah, exactly. And I was like, you got me. You, you got, got me. me. It was the toilet yeah. paper. You know, and then when I moved to Houston, I had five police officers in my driveway. And I had to verify that that was my house. I had to get someone from work to verify that that was my house. And so when that happens, you keep thinking, wait a minute, what century are we in? Um, and I think it's more important, obviously, today than ever, that, that as wrong as that is and as angry as I was inside, I had to react in a way that would save my life. And so to say that it's not out there, I know I, I, I don't dwell on it, I don't, it, but, but when people say, um, you know, that was a long time ago, that whole slavery thing is a long time. No, it wasn't a long time ago. We're, we're still in the midst of it. And I think what happened with our civil rights movement, you know, the last time that we did this in a big way in the 60s, we got to the midway point and got comfortable. We didn't finish. And I don't know that we will ever in our lifetime really finish, but as, as Duncan alluded to, I think it's getting better. Even when somebody called him that name, it really, did they understand what they were really saying or did they mm -hmm. really just want to get to him emotionally? Um, so I, I urge everybody to study your history. You'll figure out why all this stuff happens if you understand your history. You know, and, and when it comes to, to um, striving to do better, for me, when I saw my family tree and I mm -hmm. realized that my father's grandparents, this is not a whole long time ago, my father's grandparents in 1863 the family of eight was sold into slavery for $100 a piece. That hurt my heart. And what it said to me was, I have to do good by them. I have to, for what they endured, I want to make up for. And I know it's just kind of emotionally and psychologically a different way of looking at things. But I, I oftentimes think when I, if I'm getting ready to get off in, in my life, if I was getting ready to get off course, I, some, in my head, felt like they were tapping me on the shoulder. I was like, no, no, that's not what we endured this for. And I always keep that in my mind. Well, your core values are so strong and everything you say and do matches what your values are. And I, I've been diving into this to think more about it with our podcast and the, the people we interview with. And you said something really profound to me because we've talked about people pulling these buildings down to try to change history. 
and we've talked about Black Lives Matter and what that movement means and and share some of those things because I think your perspective is so fresh and and gives us so much to think about because we need to still talk about this and figure out responses instead of just anger and hate. Yeah, I think what we what we are lacking is a full understanding of history and including everybody's story. So instead of taking history away, I'd like to add history. Mm-hmm. It's like I remember going through school and slavery was um, you were a slave and then you weren't. We never understood that on the backs of slaves, the economy in this country was built. It was not right. Mm -hmm. But when I look at the flag, when I look at the flag, of course, I was a military brat. But when I look at the flag, those stars and stripes belong to me also because of the story I just told you. Mm -hmm. You know, that that, that I came from a family that has slaves in it and they, they, they worked it, right? They went through the worst of it those stars and stripes belong to them too, which means they also belong to me. And so I I kept hoping that maybe history classes would get even better, that you would learn about all the contributions that African-Americans also made to this country. And a lot of times in the history books, you just don't see it. The inventions that you use every day, we don't see it. Um, So, you know, I I, I were talking about slavery at one point. Like, what did you really learn about how how African-Americans really dug in and own a part of this country as well? Actually, my teacher, uh, my history teacher, uh, Mr. Ellison, uh, he actually kind of uh, took it farther and actually really explained it because he kind of thought, you know, he believed that he really needed to tell the history. That wasn't really, in the book. That yeah. wasn't in the book. So we would go very far into it and really explain it to you. But I know a lot of other teachers don't do that. A lot of other schools don't really go into full detail of what actually happened. And, you know, about you know, the Dutch going into Congo, taking a lot of slaves and a lot of the West African genocides and all that. A lot of it's untouched, I think. And I think it's because they don't really want to talk about, a lot of countries don't want to talk about what they did in the past. But well, you're a history. Yeah, you're a history. But yeah, he so loves history. Yes. You yes, do. So much. there's a country you're fascinated with. Will you tell us about that journey? Um... My favorite, so sorry, ask the question. Yeah, like, what's the country you're obsessed with that you had to learn their, their ancient language? Oh, um, there's a few of them. Uh, the Scandinavian countries, uh, the Mongolian Empire like that. <laughs> Even the, uh, the Aztec empires like Mexico and all that. Um, a lot of the African empires, there's a lot of them. There's too many to yeah. name. But you taught yourself Old Norse? Oh, I know, so I know a little bit of it. Can you say some for us? Um, there's anyone who speaks Icelandic here, please don't judge me. It's not my first language. Well, there's Yekminjota Fesha Ifuit Davish. I don't know what you said, but. It sounds fascinating. I bet that if we were at Tulu and you said that to a woman, she might sit down and talk to you because that sounds pretty cool. Does that mean that when you turn. I think that means when I'm 16, Mom, I want a brand new BMW. Well, let me say in um, English, no. <laughs> okay. Where the word no come from? No? Yeah. Uh, Latin, I think. Because okay. right. I say it in Spanish, too. So. But I love that you okay. have gone down this path. Even when you were younger, you took all these interesting camps, and you loved your science camp as a young boy. You w- didn't necessarily love school, but you loved that. So how are you embracing that? He loved hands-on, like it, at, um, at one of his, the places, it, he uh, was able to make crepes and stuff like that. So he was like, he would, every day he'd come running out with something, look what I made. Well, here's what uh, a lot of my teachers figured out. As soon as I would um, get paper, mm-hmm. I would automatically shut down and be like, I don't want to do this. So every single time I would get a paper, my teachers at um, Bunker Hill would usually give me an experiment to do with it. Mm-hmm. Or I could watch videos on it, and they would really tell me about what I'm actually doing instead of just giving me a paper and telling me to write stuff on it, which is honestly all I saw when I was a kid. So, so that didn't really work. So he had to use his hands, and then one, one day I picked him up, and he had this for Halloween. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> nice. But then here's how he thinks. You talk about the ADHD, Rob. Uh, they were all making roses in class. And, and the way that he made his, he didn't follow directions. He wanted his leaf to bend instead. And so his became a different little porcelain rose with the bent leaves. Here. Here. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. It looks like a big tongue on it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> like, but he bent his leaf and it was like, you're not following directions. He's like, yeah, but it's art. Well, she, she actually likes it. <laughs> yeah. Stop, she stopped arguing with me for a second. You know what? That's actually, I forget that. Good. Yes, following directions is following directions is difficult because they want you to read the directions before you have to assemble something. And I was really very mechanical, but I had to build a bicycle when I was young and this and this. It's, and if you don't read the directions, you usually end up with a little bag of extra parts that you should have put in there when you read the directions. But you'll or make you become an artist who's one of the masters. Like yes. and stuff. They all sometimes breaking rules creates new things. And sometimes breaking rules, you're right, causes problems. Well, with art, breaking rules is will always create a new art. So there's not really any rules in art. I'm good with that. I, I think it's easier to ask forgiveness than it is permission. So let's talk about school. Your school, didn't they give you a chance to choose if you want to be in person or virtual? They did. And uh, school starts virtually on the 24th. Uh, they gave them a choice, but then they pulled it back, and we're not quite sure uh, when in-person will start. Oh, uh, so they're waiting to see. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So do but, you... you know, I, if for his choice, I mean, he, he, what would you like to do? I mean, I'd rather go to school just for the... Soul, a lot of it's for the social aspect, and I kind of have to... I kind of have to be there. Because, you know, whenever I'm at home, like, I mean, I don't really care for the stuff I'm learning anyway. So whenever I'm there, like I'm in the school, like I'm not at home, but when I'm here, you know, I'm home, I have an Xbox and a PlayStation, and I'd rather do that a thousand times more. It's not that you don't like learning, it's that if you're going to learn, you want to engage with someone. Well, also I kind of, well, I kind of like, like to learn things I like to learn or things that are very useful. Well, that's yeah, what I, that like that's what you were talking about earlier is all these languages you learned. And it's so obscure and it's so fascinating to me that you can dive into that and that's what kids learn by is something that they like. And I think that's the hard thing with this journey right now is us figuring out how to inspire kids to learn. And as you know, Deborah, so many kids never even checked into school, never yeah. signed on to their, my friends as superintendent at Harmony. And I think a third of the kids didn't even check in since March. Right, right. I, I think one of the things that, that, that it's gonna, they're going to be challenged with is that, you know, school has a structure to it. And it needs to have a structure to it but there's also more ways to learn, right? And there's a woman that, that lives, one of my neighbors, she was teaching kids about the solar system. And one way she did it was they went up on the top of the parking garage and then they drew the solar system. All the kids drew the solar system. It was really cute. And then she was uh, teaching about the phases of the moon. She had Oreo cookies. And so she had, the icing was, this is a full moon. Now give me a half moon. Now give me a quarter. So the kids were scraping off the icing and they put them on this little, um, this template that she had. And so I think what's going to happen with this is that it is going to force the education system to explore other ways that kids can learn. Absolutely. Because that's our future as a country. As, as a these, world, as a world right now. Yeah, as a world, right? That we can all come together. And now, I think we should have had a gap year and just have like a COVID gap year and then said, okay, everybody, we're going to pick back up in a year. Now go out into the world Completely. and learn something. And then from all the doctors you've talked to and all the information that you've pulled together, are you hopeful that what they have in Russia or what we're pulling together here in the medical center, I know there's so many breakthroughs, yeah. do you have a vision in your head that you keep focusing on to think we're going to get there? It'll happen. It just will happen. I mean, look, at there are other diseases that we've dealt with over history. We have the, probably we know more about it today than ever before. Uh, it'll get there. The thing is, is that we just have to do our part. And when, once you start thinking like things are hard, and things are hard. I rep interviewed uh, Representative Crenshaw the other day, and, and he just, he made the point, he goes, yes, no one guaranteed you that there wouldn't be tough times in life. He goes, you know, and he, you know, he, he got blown up. He lost his vision and he went back in for another tour. And I'm like, now, wait a minute, Crenshaw, you are, you are made of something different. You are a yes. seal. And he goes, yeah, but, um, and then we have a friend who lives in England who remembers, you know, as a little boy running outside, running outside when the rations truck would come by once a week, grabbing this big can of potted meat and not knowing that they would get one the next week and trying to dodge bombs while you got back to your house. He's like, Deborah, I know it's awful. I know it's tough, 
but you know, just know that things could be tougher always, right? But so you, you, you're reminded of those things. And then you ha I have friends who, it's amazing, uh, their, their parents are living in Vietnam and they, they're working the, you know, the, the, the agricultural fields and she called to see if they were okay. And they're like, what virus? Oh, well, we don't know about that. We're just, we have everyday life. We're just we're not gonna do anything about it. We just have everyday life. Um, and things happen in everyday life. So it's just, it's kind of crazy, but yes, I think a country like America, when you look at how strong our economic structure is, our socializing you know, structure, all of those things is it much harder for us today than it would have even been 50, 60, 70 years ago when we had a big portion of the population that was rural. Talk about social distancing. Well, it's like the next farm is like five miles down the road, so we're good. So uh, it, it just, it challenges us to do things better and hopefully we learn from this, but there's no guarantees that there's not another one around the corner at some point in life and, and it will come as a part of that life cycle. Well, I worried when COVID hit that, that fashion wasn't going to have a place anymore. I thought everybody's going to be so f focused on um, surviving safety, mm -hmm. health. I worried that our business wouldn't survive, that we would have to find a new thing to do. And then we went to social media and we started coming out and just talking about the history of fashion and talking about things that you could wear to cheer you up or what we're doing as a family to come together. And I think the way we all communicate has changed. I think it yeah. slowed us down in a way. I mean, you and I, we used to go to five events a week and when you used to go to five events a night and then mm -hmm. you'd be the, the speaker up there. Charity looks different now. Fashion's different, but you well, if, always if you think about it in fashion. What I love about it is that what fashion is, is humanness, mm -hmm. right? Um, it, it is when you look at a piece of something that somebody handmade at one point, and you, you look at, uh, like in France, for example, they, they have embroidery schools. Like, it's like, they're like, congratulations, your daughter getting into college. It's like, yes, where's she going? The embroidery school, right? Because it means something. If you look at, you know, almost every country around the world, there's something artistic in their fashion. You know, the kente cloth that tells you what tribe someone's from in Africa, the, um, the, the kilts that you'll see, that the, the family tartan, right? In, in Ireland and Scotland, and so it, it, it's a it's a human thing. It's something that that belongs to us. It's our culture. It's our history. It's our it's our present. It's going to be our future. We have museums with these things in it. And so you know, why do we build these big buildings and 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 house all these things if we don't understand the importance of it, right? And it takes us through a journey of we've been there, and we are here now, and we will go somewhere else later. But it will keep marching on. And what I love about your fashion is it's so real. Again, getting back to living the authentic life. You mix the high and the low. Like me, I can get a dress from Target, but if I'm wearing a great watch and a cool bracelet, and you are the master at that. And again, you used to have four costume changes a day, so you had to have the closet that went on forever so has COVID, are you excited not to dress? Or I mean, you still have to dress because every day you're on TV. Well, but are I you embracing? To, I was embracing, I was excited going through my closet because I found things that I forgot that I had. And so I was like, and you know, I, I, I did, seriously, there are some there are some dresses that I've been wearing on the show that I've had for probably 10 or 15 years. And I'm just like, I just put a new necklace on there or a belt. And the funny part is like, I've been all different sizes. So when I'm smaller, the dress looks a little bit different on me than when I was bigger. Like I have a couple of dresses that I was wearing as tunics <laughs> when I was bigger. I would put a pair of leggings on and a dress and a belt. And I was like, yeah, here we go. And, and now I can wear them as a dress and I can like show my legs. Right. So, so you just, you know, you just gotta, you gotta, gotta hang tight and work with it. But, but you're right. I, it, wherever I find something that fits me, that's what I want. And if you buy right, it's all good. And Duncan, you have a cool style. Most of the time, you've got on a T-shirt, pair of uh, see, jeans. I, I am a, I am a big fan of style. It's one of my things. It is. So tell us about your style. Are you, do you do back to school shopping? I mean, we used to do back to school shopping. Did you go? Yes, I usually do go get some nice clothes for school. So you and normally? Good, but now we're looking at a good set of pajamas. I know, right? All over except the alarm. Is it about a cool backpack? Like, is there a backpack that everybody gets? Is it cool tennis shoes? Oh, is no. There tennis, any... shoes, tennis shoes are a tennis huge shoes style. Are huge but not just style. one pair of tennis shoes. you got to have lots of different tennis shoes. Is that your gig? 
Sorry? Your, your footwear. You have everything kind of. Oh, uh, I usually wear, um, I just now recently kind of started getting into shoes, but I usually wear like top siders like those. You don't have I'm any, like, easy, you don't, you don't have any easies? The big old no. tennis shoes, those crazy things? <laughs> oh, what do they call them, Bella? Yeezy. See, I always get it wrong. No, I think it's Yeezy. 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 We can't even go. say it right. Yeah, he even has a pair of blue suede shoes. Oh, gotta love that. Well, um, we loved having you today. You guys are um, such an incredible mother-son duo. I love the way you can stay connected because teenage years are hard for parents. Do you have any? Unless you're in quarantine, <laughs> then, then they're like right here all of a sudden. It's like I feel like I actually the good thing about this, I feel like I got extra time with them. I know that, that is the best thing people have been saying about quarantine is family. He's like, what are you talking about? Every night I would come in here and watch something. I know that's what I'm saying, but like, like in quarantine, like I would be out before I would be out doing a gala. Like y'all would be out at a gala, right? Exactly. Be raising money for some gala, and like now I'm home. It's a lot of togetherness, Duncan. Just, just, just agree with your mother and tell her. Yes, it's yeah. mom. It's been yeah. fantastic. I really love all the time we've spent together. I love all the time we spent together. <laughs> In fact, one day he said to me, he goes, I was doing an interview because I do all my interviews over uh -huh. a laptop at home. He goes, I go, I'm working right now. He goes, you're just working a lot lately. I go, no, you're actually seeing me work now. Before you yeah. ever saw me work, I was at the office. Exactly. So do you have any parting words for parents for this year going into school, <laughs> Deborah? <laughs> or Duncan? Duncan you, tell them, you tell them your parting words and I'm going to tell them mine. Yeah. <laughs> Any it's words for parents or for kids starting this new crazy school year? Inspiration from Duncan Horn. All right, you don't have any. Um, here's, 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 here's my advice. Okay. <laughs> my advice is pray, pray to whoever your God is, pray, and and oh then God. and then drink, and then like you know, do communion or something. This is, this is all I got for you, people. This is all I got for you because I am going to lock and load when it's time to start. And I, I just, I would say to people that the school system understands that this is crazy and this is different, and we're we truly are all in it together. The whole world is in it together. So it's like, do your best, do the best that you can, and and this too shall pass. And I love what you said earlier because we've been watching so much Netflix and so many movies and we've been watching Outlander and a few other crazy like. But the thing that I noticed in that is looking at the Scottish-British War from the early 1700s. They were literally fighting for their life. They were literally fighting for their food, for where they would spend the night safely. They would wake up with a sword on their face. And then you get this perspective. It's like, Oh, I'm so upset I can't go to dinner with my friends. Or, oh, I'm so upset that I can't connect in the way I did before. Or and I... I'll go back to what I said earlier. I cannot imagine working in a cotton field, taken away from my family in a whole new country, and getting through that. We can do this. We can do it. We can do COVID. Well, you guys are the picture of authenticity. Hugs and kisses till we get to see you again. Looking forward to our giveaway. Yes. yes. This week. And uh, and we brought swag for you that we will give you later because it doesn't really work when it's virtual. Okay. <laughs> but I but I did bring it, so we did have swag for you. Yeah, you know when I come into the store, it's over for me. Oh yes. I'm just like, oh, I love that. Yeah. But you buy it right. Yes, 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 yes. Well, great to see you guys. Enjoyed it. We look forward to lunch out on a patio somewhere or dinner on a patio soon to see you social distance and um duncan you and i'll talk we'll catch up off lot off air yes city center okay <laughs> ciao everyone bye-bye bye, -bye. bye. Uh, you